Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to Apostle fifth webinar on COVID-19. I am Professor Yokosuka from Chiba University, Japan. I was the president of Apostle 2016 in Tokyo. I'm going to chair this seminar with Professor Ghani from Indonesia, although not connected at this moment. Uh, Professor Ghani is the president of Apostle 2020 uh, in Bali, as you know. Um, today's seminar is on hepatocellular carcinoma. I think SCC is very important for all of us, Apostle people, because uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is very uh, common in this area and majority of SCC cases are living in Asian Pacific region where hepatitis B and C are uh, uh, very common. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Shina from Juntendo University in Tokyo. I will introduce him. Um, he is a graduate of University of Tokyo and got his PhD with a study of randomized controlled trial with ethanol injection therapy, PET, and RFA in small hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, he moved to Juntendo University in 2012 he is an expert on local regional therapy of SCC and um, performed more than uh, 11,000 patients, uh, performed RFA on 11,000 patients with liver tumor. tumor. Uh, he was uh, president of APASO Single Topic Conference 2018 in Yokohama and on SCC. Today, he will talk on diagnosis and treatment of SCC, how to manage SCC in COVID-19 pandemic era. era, era. Uh, Professor Shina, please start your lecture. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Shina of Japan. Today, I will talk about consensus recommendations on the management of hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm sorry. Where's my... oh. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by the novel coronavirus and it has been giving the devastating impact on the recurrent medical care system. As of 7th of May 2020, COVID-19 epidemic has resulted in over 3.7 million confirmed cases across 215 countries, areas, territories, and over 215,000 deaths. A new model study showed that intermittent period of social distancing strategies will be needed into 2022 to ensure that the medical system has enough critical care capacity for future COVID-19 patients. There are quite many guidelines and recommendations on COVID-19. However, there are only few guidelines and recommendations on the management of hepatocellular carcinoma during COVID-19 pandemic. Liver cancer is the fourth most common cause of cancer-related deaths in the world, which caused 782,000 deaths in 2018. More than 90% of liver cancer is hepatocellular carcinoma. The majority of, of cases of hepatocellular carcinoma are found in the Asian Pacific region. The 
Regarding COVID-19 and uh, cancer, patients with cancer may be susceptible to infection during the vital epidemic than individuals without cancer. It is due to their systemic immunocompromised states caused by the malignancy and anti-cancer treatment, which might also be at increased risk of severe COVID-19. Patients with cancer have a significantly higher risk of severe events, such as being admitted to the intensive care unit requiring invasive ventilation and death compared with the patient without cancer. Regarding the COVID-19 and chronic liver disease, most patients with hepatocellular carcinoma have underlying chronic liver disease resulting from chronic HBV or HCV virus infections alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. No evidence suggests that patients with chronic liver disease are at increased risk of the novel coronavirus infection. Generally, a diagnosis and treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma which is a highly malignant tumor, should not be delayed because of the pandemic of COVID-19. However, for the patient with confirmed or suspected to have the novel coronavirus, diagnosis and treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma should be postponed until the virus is eradicated or they are confirmed as not being infected with it. The indication and principle of management of hepatocellular carcinoma should be the same as in non-pandemic circumstances. Regarding hospital preparedness for COVID-19, not only all patients, but also all staff are at risk of being asymptomatically infected with the novel coronavirus in the pandemic areas. So if circumstances allow, hospital preparedness is recommended as follows. Minimal exposure to medical staff by using telemedicine wherever possible, wherever possible. Use of the appointment registration system, set up reception inspection, including checking body temperature and questionnaire with symptoms such as fever and cough, respiratory syndrome symptoms, recent history of close contact with confirmed or suspected person to have the novel coronavirus. regarding the surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma. It is recommended to limit the usage of ultrasound. Since ultrasound practitioners are in close contact with the patients, as a protection for both ultrasound practitioners and patients, surgical face masks are necessary for ultrasound practitioners. Patients are also suggested to wear face masks. Every patient should be considered as possibly infected to the novel coronavirus. Therefore, after each examination, thorough cleaning of a gel bottle and all touch surfaces should be performed using disinfectant. Regarding the diagnosis for hepatocellular carcinoma, in general, dynamic CT, dynamic MRI, 
or EOB MRI is recommended as a first-line diagnostic tool for hepatocellular carcinoma. When a screening ultrasound shows a possible HCC nodule, contrast enhanced ultrasound, which is very sensitive to detect hypervascularity in the nodule. and ultrasound practitioner. As every patient possibly infected with a novel coronavirus, those who have an abdominal CT in their investigations may also have a chest CT scan at the same time. However, we don't recommend CT screening for COVID-19 as they did uh, American College of Radiology, Royal College of Surgeons of England, Royal College of Radiologists, it, uh, that do not recommend CT screening for COVID-19. So chest CT should only be deployed in very specific circumstances. CT screening for COVID-19 has a low pickup rate in asymptomatic patients infected with two novel coronavirus and a 20% false negative rate even in symptomatic patients. Regarding treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma, American College of Surgeons recommended elective surgery acuity scale to further assist in the surgical decision making process to triage non emergent ovulations. Hepatocellular carcinoma and most cancers are considered as progressive diseases. Thus, it is recommended not to delay its curative treatment, such as surgery and ablation. Uh, this is the uh, elective surgery acuity scale uh, uh, di divided uh, non-emergent non operations into six subcategories and uh, most cancers are here to the L3A. So uh, the treatment in to the L3A should not be postponed. Uh, so, liver resection with that curative intent should not be delayed. However, in cases of high risk of decompensation or com comorbidities that increase the risk of severe COVID-19, surgical intervention should be postponed. One alternative therapy such as ablation should be adapted. Liver transplantation for patients with poor short-term prognosis is in high priority and should not be delayed. However, elective living donor transplantation should be suspended to minimize the risk of the donor and the recipient. Um, in patients with complete response to bleeding therapy on transplant list, transplantation should be delayed. Regarding ablations, so image-guided Parkinson's ablation such as radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation, and others are minimally invasive therapies for hepatocellular carcinoma. Ablation with curative intent should not be delayed. Uh, this is our ablation sweet. Uh, the patient is, is now in the upright position and I treated the tumor in, in the left lateral subsegment. Um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the letters of the soft trial. Uh, 
trial, a uh, randomized control trial between the surgery and radiofrequency ablation. And in SAF trials, recurrence free survival was not different between surgery and radiofrequency ablation. Hazard ratio was 0 0.96. The uh, recurrence free survival was not different between the two therapies at all. So, in cases of three or fewer tumors, each three centimeters or smaller, and food liver function is child Q class A or B, ablation is an acceptable alternative to surgical resection. Uh, ablation itself is not an aerodose generating procedure. So ablation is performed with local anesthesia in many institutions. And uh, ablation with local anesthesia is not a aerodose generating procedure. So we only need a, a standard uh, personal pro protective equipment. I wear head covers, eye guard here, and surgical mask, isolation gown, and gloves. Patients also should wear a face mask, and the oxygen mask should be on the top of it. But, But in some institutions, ablation is performed with general anesthesia, like this. So general anesthesia is considered an aerodose generating procedure because of uh, intratracheal intubation. So when general anesthesia is performed, ablation rooms have to be considered as high risk areas of infection. So. Uh, they need to have a higher level of PPE. Vascular interventions such as transcatheter arterial embolization and uh, arter hepatic arterial infusion chemotherapies are not aerodose generating procedures. So vascular interventions are used not as curative but in many cases, vascular interventions are used not as a curative treatment, but as a site reductive treatment. So vascular interventions, most vascular interventions should be postponed in cases of high risk of decompensation or comorbidities that increase the risk of severe COVID-19 because of the reduced inpatient bed for post-procedure care. Radiation therapy is used for asymptomatic bony metastasis and other conditions. Palliative care patients receiving the therapy to control symptoms or at low risk of progression, is better to delay the schedule of radiation. However, radiation therapy for patients with rapidly progressing hepatocellular carcinoma may outweigh the risk of novel coronavirus infection. Function or life-threatening situations such as spinal cord compression and inferior vena cava syndrome have to be treated without delay. Regarding systemic therapies, in patients with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma who require systemic therapy, oral thyroidine kinase inhibitors would be better than infusion regimen in the pandemic era of to protect both patients and medical staff. If available, video calls should be used 
to manage the common adverse events. Intravenous chemotherapy should be administered in a dedicated session of outpatient service. The impact of immunotherapy on the course of COVID on the course of COVID-19 is not known because there is no sufficient data. Regarding follow-up for hepatocellular cartoma, it is generally recommended to follow up the patient by telemedicine or online consultation and to avoid hospital visit in the circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic. However, due to its high frequency of the recurrence in HCC, imaging examinations such as contrast-enhanced CT or contrast-enhanced MRI to detect recurrence at an early stage should not be postponed. We need to detect the recurrence at an early stage, even in the era of COVID-19. So we should do the uh, follow-up as usual. So I'd like to summarize my talk. Uh, these recommendations have been developed to preserve and sustain as adequate clinical practice in the management of hepatocellular carcinoma in the era of COVID-19. The collection of measures implemented by frontline medical professionals. These recommendations are likely to evolve over time as future data becomes available. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Sheena, uh, for your uh, nice lecture. And um, uh, uh, there's uh, only one uh, question, but not so much related to the COVID-19 infection. Uh, first one is uh, RFA versus microwave, microwave ablation in HCC, which is yeah. better? I think the... So now, at present, we need both. Because the, so microwave, microwave ablation can produce a large ablation zone in a shorter period of time, in a shorter period ablation time. However, uh, so at present, uh, we mainly use uh, the imprint, and the, we can get a larger volume of ablation in a shorter ablation time. But the, the, the antenna of my, uh, microwave ablation is somewhat more difficult to insert into the tumor. So if the tumor is located in a very uh, delicate area at, at, the early, at the site of uh, risky, at lo risky location, I would like to use uh, so radio frequency ablation. So we use both microwave ablation and radio frequency ablation at present. So if the tumor is located, not so difficult site. In that case, uh, I prefer to use radio uh, microwave ablation because microwave ablation can generate can get to the uh, larger ablation volume in a shorter period, shorter time. But the, so if the tumor is located in a very delicate place like the, the any other, uh, so, Gullisonian thesis or any other heart, in that case, I'd like to use uh, radio frequency ablation. Okay, thank you. And then, um, uh, in your talk, you are rather uh, very uh, aggressive for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma in general. But then, 
uh, well, uh, it depends upon the situation. And then uh, about the diagnosis, yeah. uh, uh, how to diagnose the faster progression of SCC uh, by maybe um, uh, tumor marker like um, FP, alpha fetoprotein, or uh, PIVCA2. Mm, how to um, diagnose the faster progression of SCC? So maybe okay. so we need to check the the change of the value of the tumor markers such as AFP and PIVCA2. So uh, the and uh, the the tumor markers elevate in a uh, shorter duration. In that case, we think uh, that this HCC, this tumor is very aggressive, we need to, very progressive, so we need to treat without delay. But the, maybe if the tumor marker is not, uh, not so um, move, uh, change, uh, so, so fast, in that case, maybe we can wait. But of course, the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is not a, uh, uh, so it is that we can wait in, in general. So, with the circumstances allowed, we should do the ablation. Mm -hmm. do the um, treatment, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, you know, um, ultrasonography is uh, uh, rather risky for doctors and maybe and, and also um, patients. Yes. Uh, so, uh, not so recommended uh, to do uh, frequently. How do you select uh, uh, cases? of um, ultrasonography. So, yeah, as you said, the, uh, the American Society of Ultrasound in Medicine and World Federation of Medical Ultrasound uh, do not recommend uh, ultrasound for screening in the era of COVID-19 because the uh, ultrasound, in ultrasound examination, yeah, uh, the, uh, there is a cross contact between the uh, practitioners and their patients. So, and we do not, at present, we do not use ultrasound uh, at all for the screening. We use uh, ultrasound uh, in cases in which ultrasound is definitely needed, like the, uh, to detect the uh, uh, so, uh, if they, uh, there are some, uh, uh, if we, in cases in which the uh, contrast enhanced CC or MRI uh, suggests the, uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma, but, but it's not definitely in that case. Uh, so, I, I would like to use the contrast enhanced ultrasound like that. Yeah, uh, about avoiding the infection of COVID-19, I wonder uh, whether um, is there any, um, well, um, uh, uh, check of the COVID-19 infection in uh, medical staff and patients. Um, do you, you have to uh, perform the PCR in every patient? No. Or every uh, medical staff? Uh, in Japan, uh, uh, so, so we don't check, uh, we don't do the PCR so frequently. May, maybe uh, even PCR, is not, the sensitivity is not so uh, very high. Maybe around 70% or so uh, at highest tone. And the, so uh, in Japan, we do, PCR uh, only in cases in which the uh, the novel coronavirus infection is strongly suspected. I mean, the in patient with the symptoms which suggest uh, uh, the COVID nineteen. In that case, we we do uh, uh, PCR, but the, uh, no, no, we don't use. Uh, uh, PCR uh, for the screening of the 
Nobel for virus infection. But so we think the, uh, uh, we should think the all people, too. Mm -hmm. uh, not only patients, but also our medical staff mm -hmm. have, a chance of, have a chance of infe being infected with the novel coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So the um, well, possibly risky uh, patients should be uh, checked uh, infection. Yeah, yes. Okay, uh, thank you. And the next question is, should chemoembolization always be postponed during COVID pandemic? If the tumor site is not big, and it has low risk of liver decompression after treatment. Uh, isn't it be, uh, better to continue chemoembolization to this case? Uh, uh, um, maybe so. If the um, um, uh, tumor is not so progressive and rather small, you don't need to do uh, chemoembolization. It can be postponed. Yeah, okay. yes, we, uh, we think we can postpone or the, uh, yeah, the, if we can do the, uh, if there is a chance of curative treatment, maybe we would choose the other treatment like ablation or uh, radiation therapy or surgery. Yeah, but the, maybe the, the chemoembolization is performed only for the uh, site reduction, palliative purpose. In that case, we should we, we think we should uh, postpone uh, chemoembolization in most cases. Thank you. Um, well, the next question is: Does COVID worsen SCC? Uh, uh, is it is reported that uh, COVID could induce impaired liver function? Uh -huh. if this is the case with the injury from viral or hepatocyte. Uh, thanks. Uh, next question is like this. Um, does, I don't think uh, there's no data whether the COVID was an HCC or not. Okay. No, no I, I, I don't think we have enough data about it. Mm. Uh, 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 what kind on next question is what kind of protective equipment do you wear in the outpatient clinic at this time of COVID air? Outpatient clinic, um, just only telemedicine, or uh, if you uh, contact face to face, uh, you have any protective equipment? Uh, Just mask. Yeah. Um, I have um, a surgical mask and the uh, so I got a fa face shield, but face shield is from upside down. But I use the uh, eye guard, eye guard on the mask. I attach the eye guard on the mask. Mm -hmm. uh. Mask and maybe a um, face shield. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, about the chemotherapy uh, and um, immunotherapy, uh, is there any um, additional side effect of sorafenib in patient of SCC with COVID-19? Maybe we don't have any data, but um, how do you think about it? Uh, is there any extra additional side effects? I, uh, we don't think we have uh, any data about it, but the, if the patient is up, uh, had a uh, definite, uh, if the patient is confirmed to be infected with the uh, novel coronavirus, uh, I think we should wait. We should postpone the treatment for a while. We should, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we should not do the uh, sorafenib for a while mm -hmm. until the, the, the virus is eradicated. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, about uh, immunotherapy, um, there's a uh, disturbance of immunity by the uh, treatment. Uh, uh, I wonder whether you should consider uh, the uh, postponed uh, immunotherapy and whether, uh, which do you prefer, uh, uh, chemo, uh, uh, immunotherapy or just um, uh, kinase inhibitor? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, I think the tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitor would be safer. Uh, we have more data, probably. So uh, we have more history of using the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So to be on the safe side, I would like to use tyrosine uh, kinase inhibitor. Yeah. Uh, so um, sorafenib. Uh, is preferred faster and, uh, than the uh, immunotherapy. Well, about the next question is, in case of portal vein thrombosis, yeah. what should be done? Uh, tear uh, versus SPRT and then taste. Uh, what do you, are you going to do? Um, in case of portal vein thrombosis? Uh, so in Japan, TIA is not available, probably, mm -hmm. uh, in our daily practice. So, may, uh, so SBR, the, with the tumor is uh, only localized. In one area, uh, we use the, uh, so, radio therapies, including the heavy ion, beam therapy or a, a proton beam therapy like that. that the, and the, the tumor is uh, in, in many areas, in many sites. In that case, and, uh, so it's, it's a common practice in Japan to, to hepatic arterial infusion chemotherapy. Well, um, about the uh, follow-up, uh, should we continue SCC surveillance every six months or can it be done every 12 months uh, instead uh, about the surveillance? And then surveillance. maybe follow up, how do you think? Um, every three months or six months or one year? Okay, so uh, about the surveillance. So I think the it depends on the uh, Risk of the de of developing hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. So uh, there are high risk groups such as uh, chronic hepatitis B virus infect, uh, infected, uh, HBV related hepatitis, chronic hepatitis or HCV related chronic hepatitis or uh, liver cirrhosis of any etiology. But the, there are some very high. Uh, super high risk groups such as uh, liver cirrhosis due to hepatitis B virus or hepatitis C virus in that case. So, of course, uh, it depends on the capacity of the institution, how many patients we can do uh, the surveillance. But if, so, if the, the, our capacity is limited, we should do the surveillance on the super high risk groups such as patients with uh, liver cirrhosis due to hepatitis B or hepatitis C virus infection, because they are, have a higher chance of higher risk of developing HCC than those with chronic hepatitis or, or with uh, liver cirrhosis of other etiologies. So the, uh, the, our capacity is limited. Uh, surveillance is should be prior, uh, should the patient with high super high risk mm -hmm. of developing HCC should have the priority and the follow up after the treatment. If we do the curative treatment, uh, uh, maybe uh, I said uh, we should do the follow up. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the normal circumstances because it, uh, if, if, if possible, uh, yeah. So it's, yeah. Okay, depend upon the um, capacity and uh, risk of the uh, 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 development of uh, SCC. Yes. Um, uh, well, we have several questions, but at um, uh, this moment, we can connect with uh, Professor Ghani. Uh, so if um, Professor Ghani have any comments, uh, please, uh, Professor Ghani. <laughs> oh, hi, hi uh, to all of you. And uh, Professor Resina, uh, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm uh, still in the hospital, uh, yeah, doing the, some uh, kind of a compli complicated uh, uh, procedures. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, in this uh, era of uh, 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 COVID-19, uh, uh, I think the, we have to consider the, the uh, surveillance, uh, which is um, very important in uh, the prevention or, uh, of uh, or, or treatment of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, so um, yeah, maybe we we can uh, uh, have a kind of a, a, a consensus uh, uh, regarding the surveillance of the hepatocellular carcinoma. In patients with uh, the, with uh, in patients with chronic uh, advanced uh, liver disease, especially uh, uh, like uh, us in Indonesia and maybe also you know, in uh, other part of the world, the uh, patients with uh, uh, telemedicine, yeah, telemedicine. So patients can consult uh, us uh, with, without uh, seeing the doctors. Uh, in, in this case, I think uh, uh, it's more. Uh, it become more, more important to uh, uh, point out or to to stress the the, the, the importance of uh, of uh, 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 surveillance uh, in patients with advanced liver disease. Uh, I think uh, uh, that's uh, uh, my comment. Uh, in, uh, uh, the, in management of uh, uh, liver cancer. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Ghani. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sina, for your nice lecture. And uh, at the end of this um, uh, webinar, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Lau, because he uh, is going to finish the APASU guidance uh, for COVID-19. Professor, now, George? Yes, um, uh, it's a very uh, nice uh, presentation, uh, Professor Shina, so thanks for the wonderful talk. And I think that HCC in the era of COVID-19 is very important in terms of our elective services and also emergency service. And maybe it's time for us uh, to um, um, segregate uh, uh, and uh, to allow the, some delay uh, in certain low-risk patients in terms of HCC surveillance. Uh, I just typed in. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we, will try to, we should try to prioritize uh, the service uh, because the safety of the medical professions uh, and also the patients is of utmost importance. Uh, and uh, we need a concerted effort to control the COVID-19. Uh, uh, the mentioning about TKI and also the immunotherapies is very important because uh, we do not have data. Maybe uh, my, my personal ex experience uh, is uh, uh, maybe we should uh, allow the immunotherapies in those uh, less severe cases. And uh, while in those uh, with advanced uh, or uh, with a risk of uh, disease progressions, uh, we should withhold. Uh, we just have a paper published of the risk score on the predicting uh, disease severity. And maybe this is useful in terms of those who are old age, obese, with comorbidity factor, maybe we should not consider immunotherapy. But for those with low risk of progression, so we 
might still need to give uh, PD-1 uh, blockers uh, for as a form of therapy for XCC. Uh, that would be my uh, comment. But uh, we have a lot to learn because uh, new drugs is coming in, drug and drug interactions uh, uh, with remdesivir and also the Avigan from Japan. Uh, there are lots of data which needs to be filled in. Uh, and especially as a hepatologist, we might be called upon to, um, uh, to be, con uh, be consulted for uh, liver enzyme derangements. So uh, uh, I hope that uh, the guidance uh, would be helpful and we will have an update uh, with the input from all of you the, uh, from time to time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lau. Um, well, uh, time is up, so uh, we have to close this session. I'd like to thank you for all the audiences for the fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.